Good evening, everyone. Good evening. It is 6 p.m. and it is Thursday the 26th. We are here with our friends of law enforcement, the Kane County Diagnostic Center, uh, the Illinois Coalition Against Domestic Violence, and the Victim, Victim Services Interventionist uh, Vanessa Body with the Elgin Police Department. How are you ladies doing this evening? Fantastic. Great. Thank you for having us. All How right. are you, Curtis? You know, I'm, I, uh, Ooh, nobody ever asks how I am. It's okay. so it feels That's so good. False, I ask you. You besides you. Yes, okay. Besides you. I'm besides here you. too, besides you. Um, <laughs> you know? I'm, I'm doing really good this evening. Um, good. I'm interested in learning about tonight's topic. We have much to discuss, uh, so I'm feeling good. I know that our listeners are as well. Mm -hmm. So our tonight's discussion is stopping intergenerational domestic violence. I'm going to read briefly from our opening statement here and give a, um, another round of introductions for you ladies. So, studies show that children who are exposed to violence at home are more likely to suffer from a range of physical and mental health problems, increase risk of substance abuse, lower educational success, and either being a domestic violence victim or a perpetrator. Um, once again, panelists for this evening, State's Attorney of Kane County, Jamie Mosser. Hello. Director of the Kane County Diagnostic Center, Dr. Alexandra Sang. Vanessa Body, Victim Services Interventionist for Elgin Police Department, and Samantha Dickens, Programming Technical Assistance Coordinator, Illinois Coalition Against Domestic Violence. Hello. All right, and this is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Thank you everyone for watching. If you have any questions, feel free to leave those in the chat. First question, is domestic violence a persistent issue in Kane County? 100% yes. And I would argue this is a persistent issue everywhere because we have never really effectively dealt with domestic violence and how to stop it. And so I just wanna give you some of the statistics for Kane County. And I wanna talk about the adult cases and then I'm gonna to transition to juvenile cases. In 2022, we had 948 misdemeanor cases and 451 felony cases. Now, my colleagues here know that it's about seven times before a person actually calls for assistance with law enforcement. And I mean seven times, seven times of some sort of violence happening. And violence doesn't necessarily mean the physical violence, but there is violence that happens. So I want you to think about that. If we have 948 cases in which police were involved, how many instances of domestic violence went unreported? That's misdemeanor. Felony is 451. To be a felony case, it means you've had a prior conviction for a domestic violence case. It means that you've battered a pregnant person knowing them to be pregnant. It means that you have caused great bodily harm or it means that you strangled a partner that you have. So to be a felony, we are escalating this to a certain level. And to have 451, which is half of the misdemeanor amount that we have, that's significant. Now I wanna counter that with 2021. In 2021, we had 955 misdemeanor cases. That's about equivalent, but we had 313 felony cases. That means we increased by 31%. That's huge. To do that, it means that we have more people committing this violence, or we have more people who are battering their pregnant partner, or we have more people who are causing great bodily harm or strangulation. And the strangulation, especially for me, is significant because I was around here in this office when the law changed that made strangulation a felony because mm -hmm. it used to just be a misdemeanor. Wow. Now, strangulation is when you impede somebody's breathing, and you can do that by pressure on the throat or even by covering their mouth and nose, or you put pressure on and you prevent their blood from th flowing. So we all know this from the George Floyd case. He could talk during everything that was happening, but Derek Chauvin put his knee on the neck. And what that caused was the blood to not be able to circulate through the body. Now I am no doctor. I think I've said that many a time on this episode, but when you do that, it's causing problems. It's causing blood not to get, to, or oxygen not to get to the brain. It's causing all kinds of issues. And what we've seen is strangulation just negatively affects people. Mm -hmm. Even if it's for a few seconds, 30 seconds, a minute, this could cause death. Domestic violence is a problem here in King County. And for anyone to pretend it's not, it means they just don't know what's going on. But this is throughout the United States and throughout the world. Was it a um, uh, real, I, I, I'm sorry, go ahead, Dr. Sam. No, I was going to um, confirm 
what uh, State's Attorney Jamie Mosser just said in terms of the diagnostic center. So we do about 500 psychological evaluations for the court system per year. Um, about, I would say, 350 of those are what we you know, consider um, general psych mm -hmm. evals, meaning it's a wide range of referral questions. Of those, I would say probably 70% are domestic violence related. Okay. So we see a high, high number of, um, and we do the evaluations on the offenders. We don't uh, you know, evaluate the victims. But we have a high, high number of domestic violence cases. I have seen in my department in the last, I would say two, three years, uh, an increase in the strangulation cases. Wow. Now what's compelling about strangulation, that in 80% of women who are ultimately killed by their partners, so we're now talking about domestic homicides, 80% of women who eventually get killed by their domestic violence have had one issue of strangulation in the past. That's terrible. It could be three years ago, it could be current, but strangulation, just one incident, is such a high predictor of future lethality, of just the injury, where when we do um, some of our risk assessments, like, you know, for example, we do the ODARL, there's, there's a whole bunch of measures that would um, um, assess risk of violence. Strangulation is a key component. Mm -hmm. If you have one incident of strangulation with your intimate partner, that puts you statistically at, at such a higher risk of not future acts of domestic violence, of, but of being ultimately killed by your partner. It seems and deliberate. It seems, deliberate. Like, a, it seems like a deliberate action. It's but Absolutely. it's also control, and these ladies can talk about that. Yes. Domestic violence involves power and control. So yes. imagine being the person who has to control whether or not you breathe. And so to me, that's one of the easy things for abusers to do is they go for the throat of the victim Absolutely. to show that power and control. I have had very chilling quotes, and it is very much a power and control mm -hmm. issue. And it's not an anger management issue. It's not that you can't suppress your irritability. It's, a much, it's very much about controlling the, uh, your partner. Um, but I have literally had many men, because most, um, not to say women don't perpetuate domestic violence, they do, uh, but the quotes from men will say, when I strangled her, I felt like God seeing the light diminish, the life diminish from her eyes. That's terrible. Uh, and, and that's not just one person. I, heard of that several times. So that's the epitome of power and control. If you are playing God with someone's life, what more horrifically but graphically quote can you get? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, the time is 6.08 p.m. Thank you everyone for joining us for this discussion this evening on stopping intergenerational domestic violence. Um, next question. Uh, how does ending intergenerational domestic violence fit into the mission of the Kane count of the uh, KCSAO? Or all of us. Or all I mean, of us. I, I want all us all the time. This is open, this <laughs> right. is open yes. discussion. So I, I will start with this part. For me, what I know is that most of the abusers that I prosecute were once a victim. And once a victim, not only because they may have been victimized, but they saw another parent get victimized mm -hmm. or a sibling get victimized or somebody else. And I, I don't want to go in this as a prosecutor to think that every single person who comes before me is the worst person. It's a learned behavior, and we know that it's learned. So for me, as a prosecutor, I hate being reactive, which means crime occurs, now I prosecute. Mm -hmm. I want to actually get into families to be prevention. able to say prevention. Mm -hmm. How can I help stop this from happening? And I tell everybody often, because I created the Domestic Violence Diversion Program under then uh, State's Attorney Barsani, who's now a judge. Mm -hmm. The reason why I did that is because as a prosecutor, I prosecuted a dad for beating up the mom, and I had to call the son to testify. And when I called the son to testify in prep with him, he's like, my dad's not a bad guy, Miss Jamie. And I'm like, I know, honey, I just, I just want to get him help. Mm -hmm. We went to trial, he was found guilty, he got treatment, never saw the dad again. 
great, I, I did everything I should have as a prosecutor. Until I became the head of the domestic violence unit, I went up to the bench, and this boy was being prosecuted for beating up his girlfriend. That's when it hit me more than I can explain to any single person that this was a kid who was so sweet and was there to protect his mom and knew his dad wasn't bad, but he learned that behavior. Um, I wanna pivot and uh, mm -hmm. give, open it up for uh, Samantha. Your work with the Illinois Coalition Against Domestic Violence, and same question, um, ending in a generation mm -hmm. of domestic violence. So it's, it's a lot of what Jamie was saying. You know, this is, it's cyclical. And we wanna intervene wherever we can. So primarily the coalition is working with DV organizations that provide services to survivors of domestic violence. And what we do is we intervene at all levels. We wanna come in and work with the kids. We wanna come in and work with the survivors. We wanna come in and we wanna work and educate the general community as well. That is absolutely critical because it's not just the responsibility of a survivor or of a person who causes harm or of the children to change their behaviors in the way that they think. It's also the responsibility of the community to change how they think about domestic violence and how they intervene and respond to domestic violence. And so when we are silent, when we look at domestic violence as a personal family issue and not as a community issue, mm -hmm. it condones it. Yeah. And that's what allows right. it to continue mm -hmm. throughout the generations. And that's where those primary levels of intervention, that primary prevention is so critical. Yes. Vanessa, same question for um, you as well. well. Like, like Jamie said, when we're, we're looking to do preventative measures, not only being reactive. Right. Of course, in a police department, we feel like we're reactive but that's why we, they have our social services unit. Mm -hmm. So we can intervene when there's not an arrest or when there's just family problems before it escalates into you know, criminal. Mm -hmm. right. So we, we, like Samantha said, we provide, um, uh, sorry, that's okay. <laughs> we provide um, all types of interventions, but we, you know, they're custom mm -hmm. to every, every case is individual. Okay. So, you know, we do the assessments, we figure out what the need is, we serve the entire family as a whole. Okay. You know, and it's, it's, it's about having trauma-informed approaches, right? Absolutely. Because that's how we yes. end it, is, is to address the trauma that comes yes. with A trauma-informed approach. Mm -hmm. Yes. Dig into that a little bit more. So, <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, trauma-based approach, uh, absolutely Thank correct. You. So, you don't wake up one day and become a domestic banner, correct? Mm -hmm. yep. There's a pathway of life experiences and just psychological makeup that may lead you there. But in essence, like State's Attorney Master said, it's a learned behavior. Violence, you, you take a little baby, they're not naturally just violent, right? right? They're learning it. So even though most children who grew up in abusive households do not go on to commit violence. However, as a child, when you witness violence, it puts you at a statistically higher risk of you yourself perpetuating the violence. Right. Now why? That's a big, you know, golden dollar, you know, million dollar question. Mm -hmm. One is role modeling, right? If that's all you know, if that's how conflict within your family system gets resolved, you, it becomes normalized. So dad thinks the soup is too, it's not warm enough. What does he do? He berates the mother. Why the hell, you know, is your soup, whatever. Mother may defend herself, it may escalate. And so the child who's witnessing, you're hearing, you're seeing, it's violence and the witnessing of it includes all five senses. Right. You know, it, it includes the words, like enmeshed in your brain, you have the images, whatever. The child, again, who are the role models? It's the parents, right? And the children just go on to, they learn what they live. Right. Children learn what they live. And if they're living in an environment where it's okay to hit each other, when you get ma angry, it's okay to um, call each other names. Right. When you get frustrated, you know, to, the, to them it works. So if they see domestic violence, someone hitting the other person and the other person cowering and letting go, to them the message is, 
violence works. Right, right. Very they simple, got what they very, wanted. Very simple, very so primal. So what, what do we call that in psychology? It's reinforcing. Is that healthy? Absolutely not. Is that toxic? Yes. Is that damaging? Yes. But does it work? Yes. But these children don't learn other coping skills, mm -hmm. right? right? And that's all they know. So when they grow up and enter the school system, that's when they start to like getting into fights in, into their peer group. Yeah. Or all of a sudden calling the teacher names because hey that, that's that's what they know right. and then they grow up further and become adults and it's you know perfect well perfectly. and you're you're always living in that that mindset that yes. fight or flight fight. type yes. of a thing yeah. and so for kids if they never have that ability to calm down if they never yes. have that stability they're never going to realize how to cope with all yes. that and I say never and I hate using that term because yeah. There are people who have grown up in domestic violence situations that have neither ended up as a victim or no. an offender. Correct. Right. But that goes to this whole trauma concept. There are yeah. some people, for whatever reason, that they can cope with trauma and they can, can become yes. everything. But for the majority of the people, that trauma can affect them in everything. And statistically, we have found that there are people who are more likely to go into the criminal justice system, more likely to have issues with obesity, with substance use issues, problems in school, mm -hmm. all of those things. And it all relates back to the, whether or not they're able to, in a stable environment, develop, grow, and flourish. I think that's a great point to segue to the second um, part of the uh, opening statement for this mm -hmm. evening. But before we get there, thank you guys for tuning in this evening. Kevin Ferguson, Josue Pais, Luz Elena Brambrila Guerrero, thank you very much for watching. All uh, of you great people out there. Daniel Calderon, Norma Peterson, thank you for all the work you do on behalf of victims and survivors. Especially Norma, who's and, always out there. Yeah, absolutely. And Samuel Ray, good evening to you as well. The time is 6, 17 p.m. Uh, okay, so, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. The criminal court system is designed to stop the abuse mm -hmm. between the parents but not to provide counseling for the child that witnesses the violence. There are ways for prosecutors, law enforcement, and the criminal and juvenile courts to effectively break this cycle. Um, now let's, let's go on to the, the third question here. Um, what effect do current laws assist or hinder the efforts of law enforcement in this area? Mm -hmm. And um, is there any legislation currently proposed or being considered that would aid in these preventative efforts? Fantastic. So, in 1986, the Illinois Domestic Violence Act was passed, and it was passed for a very good reason. And the reason was because everybody believed this to be a family issue. So if a husband beat a mother, if a son beat his sister, police officers responded and they said, well, this is a family issue, let's make sure you take care of this. Now, the problem is that in a power and control situation, when there is a victim, who feels that they don't have it or their power has been taken away mm -hmm. to not have some sort of intervention meant it kept going. Mm -hmm. And we saw our domestic violence in the 60s, 70s, 80s just increase right. until this initiative. And I'm so proud of what people did in 1986 because of what was needed. But what they did in the Illinois Domestic Violence Act is they mandated an arrest when necessary. So when an officer believed that there was probable cause that abuse occurred, and that an arrest would prevent further abuse, it mandated the arrest. Now I'm on board with this. I absolutely mm -hmm. like the concept behind this, but the problem is there are some situations that an arrest was not the right thing to go. And I have to say that for law enforcement, and I wanna be there for uh, the police officers, there has been case law that has just been horrific to police officers that have found them personally liable and cities liable so that officers believe their only option in any situation is to arrest, despite the fact that it has this very one small term that says when necessary. Mm -hmm. And the worst part about all of that is that this counts for juveniles just as much as it counts for adults. Mm -hmm. In our juvenile justice center, the majority of the kids who are in there are in there for domestic violence offenses. Mm -hmm. There is a um, horribly named uh, study called the Adolescent Domestic Battery Typology Tool, and I feel, I feel like we got to shorten that, but basically <laughs> says that there are certain instances that domestic violence happens, but it's not power and control. So let's say my son today goes to my daughter and shoves her, and because she has the mother of the state's attorney, she's like, I'm just going to call the police. 
The police come. She says, I got pushed. I felt pain. The officer should use that when necessary and not arrest her because, or not arrest my son because it's a when necessary, but maybe they do because they're so afraid of what could happen. And so we find that there are these one-off incidents. We also find that sometimes there's just something that's going on that's causing this, maybe bullying in school. We find that there's family chaos. And then we find the rare instances right now for juveniles where there is actually the power and control type of a situation. Mm -hmm. But when you mandate arrests, especially in juveniles, you're gonna find that we're creating more trauma because mm -hmm. putting handcuffs on a kid, bringing them to yeah. a police station, bringing them to my juvenile justice center, it's not really mine, traumatizing. I really gotta say it's not mine, but bringing them to the juvenile <laughs> yes. justice center, it's more trauma. I want us to see now how we can expand on this to make sure that we mm -hmm. provide as many services to juveniles to start off with, but start focusing on that in adults and bringing law that will allow us to be able to come into the entire family to provide them services. Mm -hmm. And it's something that I learned in New Orleans when I was a prosecutor down there. There was a law called FINS, Family in Need of Services, where we can actually go in and help the entire family when we saw this chaos that was happening. So I am proposing legislation that will take juveniles out of the IDVA. I'm also proposing how we can get something more like this FINS petition in Illinois mm -hmm. so we can truly help people. Excellent I, response to that question. I would like to comment on that. I would love your comments. <laughs> because... Emily and Nick, good evening to you. Oh. <laughs> um, I just speaking for, for the Diagnostic Center. Mm -hmm. The juveniles that come through our system where we have to do the psychological evaluations on them and they are, you know, have been charged with some sort of domestic violence offense. I think the system does not, because of what you said, do a good job of differentiating mm -hmm. power control versus something else. Right. Mm -hmm. I would say the majority of the juveniles we see, the problem is they've been abused by the parent over and over mm -hmm. for years and years. The one day they decide to stand up to their abuser and maybe push the parents. Or defend the other Or parents. defend or whatever, but they're hands on. Mm -hmm. But maybe it took them four years to rally up that courage and get physical. Mm -hmm. So the parent calls, police show up, and guess who gets arrested? It's the juvenile. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's why I am glad that you know we at the Diagnostic Center could provide that service to mm -hmm. kind of differentiate between those juveniles that maybe are showing signs of dating violence right. and the adolescent teen power and control versus the trauma, yeah. the trauma response on that day given in that moment in time, yes, it was technically a battery, mm -hmm. but the dynamic is just so different. Right. And, and I think we have to add, it's all dubbed as domestic battery, but I think there's just such nuances where you yes. have to separate right. and not treat the two no. as one and the same. And I have to see, you I probably see, see this You've seen that, that. I was at the say, department. Um, yeah, I, I definitely agree. And we also see um, a lot of times when there is domestic violence where um, when the teenagers are starting to be rebellious, out of control, maybe a little bit more violent, yeah. breaking things, um, the parent calls the police immediately yes. on them. Mm -hmm. But does never called on the offender or the husband right. or the partner, so that we all we intervene when we figure out there's a lot of domestic violence going on, and and the children get the bad end of that stick yes. because they do get charged. Yes. Yeah, you that's know? unfortunate exactly. to have so, yeah. would, to be involved or inter, to be introduced to the system mm -hmm. as a right. young person in that way. Yeah. As a victim. Yeah, really. right. in that fashion, yeah. Right. And Curtis, because keep it in mind, I mean, talk about Elgin is so forward with trying to really yes. be in the community to help right. people. Very much For so. For sure. Yes. So, like I said, again, we, we're coming out and getting involved when, before there's an arrest, almost always, trying to do the That's entire awesome. family. Yeah. And so, um, but for the juveniles, I just think that is, that is a good thing that we are trying to... Um, offer more services, acknowledge the trauma, acknowledge the things that they're mm -hmm. dealing with and the behaviors rather than punish them. This is a yeah. very fruitful discussion for mm -hmm. Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Our conversation tonight is Stopping Intergenerational Domestic Violence. I have a great panel and we are here at the Kane County State's Attorney's Office 
Time is 6.25 p.m. Next question. Y'all ready for the next question? Oh, sure. Y'all tore that last one apart. <laughs> <laughs> Left the bones on the table of it. Um, now, uh, so with this question, uh, we're going to start with Samantha. And everybody, please contribute to this next question. What role do drugs and alcohol play in domestic violence and an offender's willingness or ability to change their behavior? That's such an excellent question because, and we were discussing this earlier, yeah. people often believe that substances cause domestic violence, mm -hmm. and that's not true. As we've been talking about, it's about power and control. It's, it's that desire to have control over another person that really causes domestic violence. Substances can make a situation much worse mm -hmm. because people will have poor judgment. They won't have as much clarity and they'll be prone to more heightened emotional responses, right? right? If they're using substances, alcohol or other drugs. Uh, and so it, it can heighten a domestic violence situation um, and lead to more severe uh, violence in, in the home. Um, but yes, substances, yeah. there's a very strong intersection with domestic violence and substances. Um, and it's something that I know domestic violence agencies see quite a bit of right. and is something that they're actively attempting to address because it is so common to see um, substances involved in domestic violence incidences and I know you all probably see the yes. same thing. I, I agree. I think there is kind of a common misconception mm -hmm. that domestic violence events are perpetrator, perpetrated when the offender is drunk or high. Mm -hmm. I would say in the repetitive chronic offender, they're usually not. They are stone cold sober. Mm -hmm. And again, it has more to do with power and control. But does it play a role? Yes, it does. Just like you, mm -hmm. you were talking about. What substances do is they serve a disinhibitory factor. Mm -hmm. So they act on your frontal lobe, which controls judgment, it controls impulse control. Mm -hmm. So whatever you're feeling in the moment, whether it's anger, it gets enhanced. Mm -hmm. And your impulse control, so, so the, the part, your internal breaks of your brain that says, oh, stop, may not be a good idea. Mm -hmm. It's kind of not there mm -hmm. right. when you're under the influence. Right. So you don't have that. So if you're thinking of acting out on something, but now you're drunk, chances are you will act out. The Where person, a sober right. person will say, well, maybe not. Yeah. Maybe I'll get in trouble. It's not a good idea or this and that. You have the, that rational part of your brain taking you through the steps. Ultimately, you know, with your decision saying it's kind of not worth it. A drunk or high person, it kind of doesn't have that. So they're like, let's go with it. That's and, what I'm feeling in the moment. And this is between right? both um, adults and juveniles. Correct. Right? Okay. Correct. Okay. Yeah, but Curtis, one of the things I want to point out is that a lot of victims for self-preservation use alcohol and drugs as self-medication. Sure. Another and sure. Gonna, yeah. factor. Like yes. Yeah. I'm going to have to coin that one for yeah. myself at this point. Yes. What I have found is that a lot of times police officers will go to a home and they'll see a victim battered and bruised but drunk and mm -hmm. um, looks as if they don't know what they're talking about. And then there's this controlled abuser. Well, look, this person was just drunk. I was just restraining her. Correct. When a lot of times victims will go towards alcohol and drugs mm -hmm. just to not feel everything of what no. they're feeling absolutely yes and we have so many situations where we see this and the abuser seems super calm and the victim seems mm -hmm. super crazy and if you don't understand the dynamics of right. what's going on we have dcfs that comes in and takes kids away especially when victims stay with abusers and mm -hmm. i don't want edit a single person on this phone call to judge a victim for staying because there's so many reasons why mm -hmm. we've covered that in a facebook mm -hmm. live so just go back <laughs> yeah i think it's another uh, podcast I, I think it was eight I, mean, I think it was i think the number yeah. was eight yes i think the number was eight it was last october uh, yeah it was yeah. eight moments of mm -hmm. incidents or yes eight incidents i yeah. believe and was the, the average it, but the problem is when when you feel bad yeah. When you feel not only physical pain, but emotional pain, what does anybody do? Right. They turn to, to something that makes them yes. feel better. Now, in a healthy relationship, the turning to something better may be going for a run. Not for me. But it may be, you know, <laughs> reading crazy. a book. Or it may be seeing a friend or something like that. 
talk in to that to situation someone. where yeah. you've been isolated from people what's the easiest thing to turn to alcohol and drugs right, right and we have to recognize that in our victims because i have seen in a lot of my victims that they've been charged with dui offenses or alcohol mm -hmm. or drug related offenses and i have to bring their trauma in mm -hmm. when i'm looking at that for the right mm -hmm. behavior and, and finessing your experience um at the police department too like like she said we do a lot of internal training to have our officers understand that dynamic to you know ask the right questions to recognize that kind of scenario yes. when the victim looks so out of control incompetent drunk or high mm -hmm. and the other person is just calm cool and collective um you know to try to gather more information or get us involved because there is a history there most sure. of the time I've, and yeah. sorry and i was gonna also say that um a lot of times in reaching out to victims, it's the first thing they say is, well, he just needs help yeah. with drugs and alcohol. And so, you know, we, mm -hmm. we work with them on understanding the correlation, but it's not the cause. You know, Correct. Like, right. Like, yes. like these ladies said. Exactly. Right. Um, yes. I, Do you I, mind I, if I yeah, add no just problem. really quickly? Please, please. Yes. The thing too about when survivors use substances to cope, that can also make them less likely to report or seek mm. any kind of assistance mm -hmm. because of fear of judgment, yeah. um, fear of being arrested mm -hmm. or losing their children. Right. Mm -hmm. Maybe they've sure. had a bad experience in the past when law enforcement has come to their home or with friends or family mm -hmm. um, or their children's school or extracurriculars. And so they don't want mm -hmm. to go through that experience again. So they won't seek assistance that mm -hmm. could be very beneficial. Um, I wonder, and, and that's where I was, I, I didn't mean to interrupt anybody, but I, I did kind of plant that mental flag. Because you mentioned, uh, State Attorney Moss, you mentioned that strangulation mm -hmm. eventually became a felony. Yes. Right, correct? Mm -hmm. Correct. And I wonder, everything that we're talking about, the victim's unwillingness to go forward or press charges, the victim's mm -hmm. reluctance or being fearful, are those the kind of things that make something like it should have been flagged as a felony and a serious issue a long time ago this is just me right not right mm -hmm. are those the kind of things that make laws slow to be changed mm -hmm. to help the victim yes okay well and the other part is so this reluctance to testify against a person okay mm -hmm. we understand why because we i can name 15 reasons right now a victim right. would not want to come forward mm -hmm. sure but the problem is in order for me to prosecute I need the person to come forward. Right. Mm -hmm. I cannot say what a police officer said. I cannot say what a person heard the victim say. I have to have the person come in. Right. And so the problem is we put all this pressure on the victim to come in to get that person help when the cycle has put that person in position where they don't want to do it. And not because they don't want safety, and not because they like getting hit. And if I hear one more person say that, I, my, I'm gonna need anger management. But I gotcha. The, thank you. The, the problem is the laws don't allow us yeah. to truly help people. Because the other part is this, a domestic battery right now in Illinois, if you're convicted of it, it means you get a conviction on your record, you can never get that taken off. And now when we started off in the law, we're like, yeah, absolutely. You hit your wife, you're gonna have a conviction. But the problem is that conviction means possibly the loss of a job. Right. It possibly means being deported. It possibly means not getting loans. Right. It has mm -hmm. all of these effects. Implications. Right, when that defendant was probably a victim at some point. Right. And so what we did is we said, yeah, we're so tough on crime, this is the way it should be. Which is one of the reasons why we have the Domestic Violence Diversion Program, and we started it here in King County. Right. And we did it because we gave people the chance to take accountability, to get treatment, and to not have that conviction. And that has resulted in the lowest recidivism of all mm -hmm. of our diversion right. programs. And I'm proud of this program. But the thing is, when you look at all of that, you understand why a victim wouldn't wanna come in. We need to do better in the legal system to support them because ultimately what I wanna do is I wanna break the cycle of violence. I wanna break it for that abuser, but I wanna be able to go in and also break it for the children because I don't want to prosecute another child. Right. Because sometimes an arrest or yes. you know those things like you talked about cause a secondary mm -hmm. trauma. Mm -hmm. If Absolutely. they have to move, if yes. they have to lose their home, you know, they lose income, 
it just changes everything right. for everyone. Sure. Starting a new so, school. And you kids guys are, are great. Yes. With, and Elgin is great. Like if there's an arrest in terms of talking to the schools too. So mm -hmm. a kid sees their parent arrested and you know what happens the next day? They're like a zombie. Yep. And a teacher not knowing any of the situation is like, what's wrong with you? Yeah. You know, you're going to get paying that attention. Start. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, Eldrin is one of the leaders right. in terms of that. So I'm very, yeah. I'm very proud the to have that. Proaction. Mm -hmm. That, that now that round of uh, question and answering, ladies and gentlemen, was so fantastically well done <laughs> that I think it makes. This next question, a moot point, but I'll throw it out there anyway, the link between childhood trauma and committing domestic oh. violence as an adult. I think no, you ladies. We got so much. Oh, we have yeah, so much I, to say. Yeah, yeah. Or we so, so, go ahead. Well, yes. yes, go ahead. Go on. Samantha? So I love this question because in all the years I've been working in this field and even now working for the coalition and working with domestic violence mm -hmm. agencies, it is very clear that people don't understand how even just a child being in a home filled with violence, mm -hmm. not even necessarily physical violence, but mental and emotional violence has such an incredibly yes. negative impact on them. They may not be the target, but even just hearing yes. it, mm -hmm. seeing mm -hmm. it has such an impact on them. They yes. carry that with them everywhere that they go. They don't feel safe, even if they're not the target, mm -hmm. because when will mm -hmm. the yelling start? When will mm -hmm. there be the threats and the intimidation in their home? You know, are they going to have to step in to protect a parent or a sibling or a grandparent? You know, they can't feel safe anywhere because they always have to go back to that home where that yes. violence exists, even if it's not directed at them specifically. Right. So yes. that impacts their whole lives. That Absolutely. Become. Everything you said is so true. And if you think about children and the family of origin, mm -hmm. the family of origin is your world as a child, mm -hmm. right? It's your parents, it's your siblings, and that acts as a blueprint mm -hmm. for how you learn to engage in future relationships. Mm -hmm. So if what you're witnessing is so unhealthy and violent and toxic, mm -hmm. people always ask, well, how do you, Children who witness domestic violence in the home because of these reasons often can grow up and be victims mm -hmm. themselves, not just perpetrators, because the boundaries are not there, mm -hmm. you know, or they're very just kind of disturbed. And when you grow up and you grow up expecting these boundaries or you yourself don't have good boundaries, it, it, it opens you up to further victimization. So we've been talking so far about children witnessing domestic violence growing up potentially with a higher risk of being uh, offenders, right? Mm -hmm. But they're also, there's a risk of being victims themselves I because know. your boundaries are so distorted. Mm -hmm. So it's one and the same. You have a risk of yeah. being both and sometimes at the same time. Right. Um, the time is 6.38 p.m. Is domestic violence an anger management issue? No. No. Okay. no. no. So, and that's a great, great question. Because that just caused us to manage our Yes. Anger. No. I see that. Because... I see that. That's why I'm behind the camera, y'all. So <laughs> anger management, let's look at it this way. Anger management is your kind of inability to cope with, um, you know, you could be impatient, impulse control. What do you do with the negative emotions of anger when they arise. So anger management, the victim could be anywhere. Mm -hmm. If I'm sit standing and at checkout and mire and someone accidentally you know, steps on my foot, if I have an anger management problem and I'm like, oh, that hurt, you know, you blah, 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 Please, anyone could I be. I think the FCC is watching. I know, so. I said <laughs> blah, 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 <laughs> so I'm very PG. Um, that's an anger management. The uh, people with anger management issue will get into bar fights. They they will right. they will verbally abuse anyone on the street. Mm -hmm. They're the road rage victims. Right. Anyone is a potential victim. In domestic violence, it is very different. It's about using violence. It's called instrumental aggression. Okay. So what instrumental aggression is? It's a tool by using violence and coercive anger to control someone else. It's very much about power and mm -hmm. control. 
hey, I don't want you to go out with your girlfriends for a girl's night out, so I'm going to throw a big rage and fit, whatever, to control you to decide to not go out I'm by make, threatening. I'm going to make a scene. Make a scene by threatening whatever, whatever it is. Very much about I'm dominant, it's power and control. That's not anger. Right. It's all about the control. And so the treatments are very different from it. You would not send mm -hmm. a, a domestic violence batterer to anger management. Yeah, that may help with the bar fights, but it's not going to help with the dynamic of you trying to control your intimate partner. Because partner. it may not also be a scene. I mean, we've all heard the term of gaslighting. Yes. Where you're making that other individual yes. feel like they're the problem, that they're, they're crazy. The issue. Yes. And they do things like, well, you yes. are doing this, mm -hmm. you are doing that, and it's yes. calm. It seems almost rational. Yeah. But it gets a person to start thinking exactly. in their head, I'm the problem, I'm yeah. the reason. Boy. So it doesn't go yes. just into the violence, it goes into this control aspect. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it, it's very intentional. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, yes. it's calculated, it's intentional and it's specific to yes. a person. So that's the difference Absolutely. between the anger management and the impulse and the domestic violence. Mm -hmm. Yes. yes. Interesting. Uh, we have some really great information. This is a fantastic discussion. Uh, good evening to Fabi RM, hello there. And Emily Bo, good to see you. Time is 6.41 p.m. Um, okay, so now let's, Lighten it up a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have that ability? <laughs> <laughs> right. I don't know what no these, y'all. I don't know what <laughs> these. Um, but um, in all seriousness, so prevention is mm -hmm. key. Yes. It's key. So let's let's um, let's flip the script a, t a tad bit. What are some best practices that we have all observed to help with prevention? Mm -hmm. And uh, Vanessa, if you'd like to start off. Um, mostly education on resources and, and places to go people to talk to um interrupting the patterns and the, the things that they have at home that they understand to be normal and familiar so mm -hmm. i think that's the start especially um with the youth yes. okay. mm -hmm. yes. so for me prevention would entail on our um, diagnostic center part is to do a very specific psychological evaluation um, that establishes risk. We In domestic violence uh, evaluation, we always end with an opinion for the court system okay. about whether this person is low, moderate, or high risk for future recidivism and future uh, domestic violence. And then with us, it's, it's the targeted treatment, right? It, it'll be like a PAPE, which is the uh, Partner Abuse Intervention Program. Mm -hmm very specific programs that will target the, the cognitive distortions about power and control. If there is a substance abuse issue, we would also recommend substance abuse treatment. If there is underlying, underlying trauma, we will also recommend some trauma because again, you don't, you don't want to band-aid mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. the issue. You always want to get into the core um, type of issues too. So for my department, we would at the offender level, kind of assess, give a good, very good clinical evaluation of where this person person stands in risk and how to mitigate that to prevent future recidivism. Okay, all right, State's Attorney. So for me, it's always wanting to do more. I look at this stuff. So I talked earlier that I was gonna go into the adult and the juvenile. In 2020, we had um, 25 juvenile domestic violence cases. So this is in the pandemic, which means not a lot of arrests are happening mm -hmm. at that time because we're trying not to. In 2021, it was still about the same because we were on and off with it, about yeah. 25. 2022, we got up to 42. And right now, before the end of the year, we're at 43. So in 2022, if we're at 42 if for the whole year, mm -hmm. and now by October, we're at 43 cases, this is problematic. Right. We know this is gonna be much more. I do not think it is good enough for me to see a file of an abuser and a victim and just deal with those two. I believe I have to do more. And so part of that is I'm gonna push legislation as much as I possibly can 
The other part is I'm going to see what we can do to correlate the kids that are in juvenile court to the people that are in adult court. So we're gonna do a study. We're, we're mm. gonna pull the parents from the kids who are in juvenile court to see if they're charged here. Because what I want to start oh, doing is actually bring in services when we start to see this. There's all these studies that I have right now that show that there's this escalating behavior and you can see that. You can see that not only when neighbors are maybe calling the police, schools are calling, mm -hmm. you know, things are happening. Mm -hmm. There's absences, kids mm -hmm. come with the same amount of clothing. To yes. me, this is just right for intervention. And as the state's attorney, what I wanna do is intervene. I would love to never prosecute a person ever again. I know that's never gonna happen, but I'm gonna work to that goal. Because if we can get to these kids and we can get to the people who are involved in these issues, we're gonna give them a tool to do something different because we're gonna be there to calm their brains down, mm -hmm. give, to give them the ability to process and have their brains grow. So I'm gonna push legislation. I have a lot of projects. In the next four years, five years, I have one more year on this term and hopefully four more, I am going to keep going forward with this to make Kane County a pilot for the entire state Excellent. and the entire United States. Excellent. Mm -hmm. All right. My and staff is super excited about all this. Right. I'm oh. excited about this. This is I fantastic. Am too. I am too. Um, well, and to get what Jamie is saying at too, like prevention is a collaborative approach. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, you can't yes. do it on your own. No Correct. one of us or our organizations can do prevention. Mm -hmm. And it is so effective that the Centers for Disease Control, the CDC, they recommend prevention as a best practice. You know, they recommend yeah. going into schools and providing programming. They recommend providing family support, you know, education on healthy relationships. Mm -hmm you know, um, social emotional education. They recommend mentorship programs and engaging boys and men as allies, mm -hmm. you know. So it it's collaborative, it has to be, because it requires all of us yes. in this room and a million people who aren't even in this room today. Right. Yes. So, and that's, it's so exciting. Mm -hmm. yes. It is. Very well yeah. said. Uh, well, how can we help you? How can we and the, the, the listeners mm -hmm. aid in any of the efforts of, with uh, what we're talking about tonight? And the biggest thing is if you see something, say yeah, something. A lot of times you hear yeah. somebody fighting or you see bruising, say something yeah. about it. If that is being an anonymous reporter to the police, if that is saying here's the information from Mutual Ground and Crisis Center, who are our domestic mm -hmm. violence shelters here mm -hmm. in yes. King County. Excellent. If it's just saying Agencies. I'm yeah. always here for you. Mm -hmm. To me, that's the biggest thing to give to a victim to help them become a survivor to me mm -hmm. is to say, I see you, I'm here. Mm -hmm. I agree, and I think that in past years and past generations, domestic violence was seen as a family problem. Mm -hmm. It's their family, let them deal yeah. with it. We're infringing on their privacy, and it's not, because that's what people used to think about child abuse, mm -hmm. right? right? That, oh, it's their parents' right to dis discipline their child the way they, and we're like, no, that's an abuse. Well, domestic violence is abuse as right. well. Mm -hmm. So like, let's get rid of this culture culture of silence and secrecy mm -hmm. that surrounds what happens uh, you know, behind the closed doors of someone's house because it's not just their family's problem. Domestic violence is society's problem yes. because the repercussions will show up everywhere. Yeah, it's a community I, problem. Yeah, I, I think, and you mentioned the you, the words used, culture. Yeah. I think um, in just Americana history, yeah. right? No matter what's right. going on, that's just happening in that household. Yep. And, and what happened was, was that, for example, the police would be called to something, but that's just even if it is a husband and wife fighting, they'll get over it. Mm -hmm. Or they're taking dad away for the night, he sleeps it off, come back, bada bing, bada boom kind of thing. Yeah. The yeah. whole thought process, the whole culture of it has yes. been set up to just not get involved. Mm -hmm. And not yeah. get involved to the fact that like, unless there is, someone ends up getting physically and egregiously hurt, mm -hmm. that's gonna be the point where the intervention happens absolutely and by that time it may be too late it may be too late mm -hmm. yes and i think that that's terrible 
Yes, um, it is. And I, I, you know, just I'd like to see the steps that have been made so far yeah. in addressing that. I think we're in a better place now. Yes. I think so too. Yeah, or or so or we're getting there because I know we did kind of talk about like the steps that are being made now to hopefully get there in the future Correct. in a better fashion. Um, yeah. Uh, the time is six fifty. Yeah. Anita Lewis, hello there. Good One evening to all of you. Great. Absolutely, member. absolutely. absolutely. Shout out to the county yes. board. Um, so you mentioned, uh, Tasty Ring Monster, you are working on the legislation. Yes. What is that process like without getting to it in the nitty gritty? How mm -hmm. is it bearing fruit, a little bit more well, teeth to pull? Um, I uh, had no idea what I was doing in the beginning. And so what I did is I just wrote what I thought was right and I just put it out there. Okay. Uh, I've learned a lot since then, which is you have to have a lot of support for it. And okay. I have to say um, our state rep, Matt Hansen, is the one who's running this legislation for me. Shout out Matt Hansen. Matt Hansen. And the thing that I originally did is I just pulled juveniles out of the Illinois Domestic Violence mm -hmm. Act for the mandatory arrest. What I didn't do though, and because I didn't realize this, is all the other effects. So you really have to change the juvenile code because part of what you have to do is put into the juvenile code the ability to give them services and to provide help. So now I am partnered with many different organizations, including the Coalition Against Domestic Violence, where we're gonna pull juveniles out, but the goal is to actually get services for the families. Mm -hmm. And so I know Loyola University is now partnering with us to be able to write effective legislation. We're not doing it now. We're going to hopefully put this forward in January. But the idea is to give a different treatment to kids so that or counties like myself can come in with this adolescent domestic battery typology tool, and I'm going to rename it at some point because that's too much, <laughs> but so that we can help train officers. This is how yeah. you should react in these situations. Perfect. And that way they're not over there in my juvenile justice center. Right. Mm -hmm. That we're actually intervening. And so we are working on this in a multi-level approach, pulling them out of the IDVA, expanding the juvenile justice code, and creating a portion under, we call it a MIRA petition, but it's mm -hmm. minors, um, oh, minors in need of intervention and authority. And authority. Yes. Something that makes my rod, that's all I know. But the problem is it really just deals with truancy instead of kids who are needing help or families that are needing help. And so we're going to push that forward so that throughout the state of Illinois we have a new chance. So yeah, I'm great. excited. And you yeah, know, Matt is exciting. Matt is really on board with helping to put this forward and I'm eternally grateful for him. Good, nice. good stuff. Shout out to Matt Hansen, he's a friend of the show. Um, I can't believe I just put that on a recording, too. He's going to use that against me. <laughs> oh, yeah, you're done. Who, Matt? Oh, yes. <laughs> That'd be a heck of an ad. Look at the good things this person said about me. That's why you should vote for me instead. We do love Matt here. Um, uh, before we end, if, uh, if you, we all could, provide contact information for folks who'd be watching this if they have any questions. Um, Samantha, how can folks contact you for more information? So folks can always call the Illinois Coalition Against Domestic Violence. They're a quick Google, but my work email address is just my last name, Dickens, D-I-C-K-E-N-S, at ilcadv.org. I'm fairly attached to my email. It's on my phone, so you will definitely get a response from me. That's enough. So we have our website, the King County State's Attorney's website, which one of these shows I will have memorized, but if you Google King County State's Attorney, you will find me. Mm -hmm. Um, and then obviously you can call us at 630-232-3500. My email is well known to people, mosserjamie at kanecountyil.gov. Got it. We are also on the website <clears throat> under uh, King County 16th Judicial Circuit. We are under court services. So even if you Google King County Diagnostic Center or court services, you can find us. Um, however, our phone number is 630-262-4480, so you can use that number to get a hold of me, and I can provide you with any resources or research, articles, anything you need. Excellent. We also have a website, it's the Elgin Police Department website. Um, you can just go under social services. Um, my email address is my last name, underscore, or B-O-T-T-I, underscore V, at org. I think, okay. <laughs> <laughs> is uh, 
Yeah. You must get out yourself. I was going to say that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not the only, I'm not the only social worker. We actually have three full-time social workers yes, and, and a supervisor. So um, we provide all services free to the community of Elgin. And there doesn't have to be a police report or incident to reach out and get help navigating whatever That's kind of services yes. you need. Yeah, that's right. And I also just want to shout out domestic violence agencies for any survivors out there or people who are loved ones of survivors, they're 24 mm seven. -hmm. So you can yes. always, always call a domestic violence organization and get a response. And again, it's just a quick Google. Illinois has a statewide hotline number, which I don't have memorized. Uh, but if you Google it, you will be connected to someone. There's also a national right. hotline number as well and they will also connect you. They'll get you to your closest or the best fit domestic violence agency for you. Yeah. So if you are seeking services, if you just wanna talk, or if you wanna know how to step in and help someone that you care about, mm -hmm. these crisis line advocates can help you with that. Mutual mm -hmm. ground in the South End, Community, Community crisis, crisis Center, Center in the North End. Excellent, excellent agencies. Okay. One of the things I wanted to add to, to Jamie and her as well, like when you asked who, what can you do, the number one thing you probably can do is not judge yes. like, mm -hmm. why they're why they're staying in this Good relationship point. what they're doing or what they should do mm -hmm. you can just let them know like I am concerned I see you like mm -hmm. you said there are places mm -hmm. that you can talk to someone maybe talk to a professional mm -hmm. without getting that judgment because a lot of times like the seven times they tried to leave mm -hmm. they went to other people to help them and they went back and they went yeah. back and people drop off and people don't mm -hmm. want right. to be involved or help and it gets isolated and that's how yeah. it perpetuates mm -hmm. and those uh, crisis lines are anonymous right you can call you don't have to say who you are where you're from if you just want mm -hmm. to talk mm -hmm. and not mm -hmm. be judged and feel that pressure yes. they will just listen very good point yeah, and uh, I think I will also mention for folks who are listening the um, domestic violence number or uh, domestic violence helpline hotline is toll free, confidential, multilingual, over twenty four hours, eight seven seven eight six three six three three eight. That number again is eight seven seven eight six three six three three eight. Thank you. Thank you. Well, this was uh, see, I told you, right? We did it. We did it, we did it. This was a good one. Um, any last words? So we usually finish with a final thought, hopefully a positive thought. Mm -hmm. Yes. Go ahead. You start. <laughs> you go first. Feel free. Believe in yourself. I'm just going to echo, like, if you see something, say something, just like anything else, um, you can be saving a life. Yep. Absolutely. It is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, and the theme for this month is everyone knows someone. Mm -hmm. And so you have mm -hmm. the power to do a very small thing and make a very big difference, even to just say, I love you, I'm here for you, mm -hmm. come find me if you want to talk, or just to sit in silence with that person and provide comfort, or to say, I have this phone number if you want it. You know, that is such a small thing, but it makes a huge, huge mm -hmm. difference. So. You have the power to do that in 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. Thanks, ma'am. I think, um, unfortunately, we live in very negative times. Mm -hmm. And I choose to be positive. Mm -hmm. And so, as the state's attorney, I see horrific things every single day. Mm -hmm. My whole career has primarily been in advocating for domestic yes. violence and sexual assault victims. And so, what I know is I can always do this better. And as your state's attorney, this is what I'm going to do. I am going to be promoting the changing of our court system so that we can take cases like domestic violence and DUI cases, where oftentimes we see addiction or cyclical mm -hmm. issues, mm -hmm. and put them all together so that we can focus on retraining, we can focus on rehabilitation, and we can focus on resources. And so by having prosecutors who are trained in that mentality, defense attorneys, judges who are trained in the mentality, we will break the cycle of violence. On top of that, I will continue to promote new legislation because I do love the idea of not saying, well, we've done this for the last 30 years, why shouldn't we do it the same way? Oh. Some of the resistance <laughs> that I'm meeting right now is, well, we've had the Illinois Domestic Violence Act since 1986, why are we gonna change it? Well, times have changed yeah. since 1986. My hair is much flatter since <laughs> 1986. I mean, these are things that change yes. over time. 
we can make this better and we can make it better for our children. We can make it better for our children and we can make it better for the survivors. And we are gonna to continue to do more here in King County because we will bring this progressive programming that helps and realizes trauma that trauma-informed that these mm -hmm. offenders are likely to have been victims. And if there are mm -hmm. some offenders that are so dangerous there's nothing we can do, we do have an option and that is prison. Mm -hmm. But the majority of these people, we can actually help them. I know just being a person that people model their parents. Mm -hmm. I know that my son is very similar to my husband. We're very stoic, doesn't show emotion a lot, but mm -hmm. has it. I know that my middle daughter is like a mini me, and I love her, but she's a mini me, so there's a lot to deal with there, and I accept that. I know my littlest one is a combination of both, where she will have that and she will also have her emotions. I keep thinking every person that comes before me got modeled by somebody. Absolutely. And if I can't realize this trauma that brought somebody to me, then I would be ineffective. So as your state's attorney, I will continue to do this. I will continue to work with great partners the police officers, the coalition, the diagnostic center to make sure that we do what's best. And we can change this, and I'm positive about that. Very well said. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for watching this evening. Uh, we appreciate it very much. This interview and episode will be on our uh, YouTube, Spotify, mm -hmm. and we'll remain there. We'll put the links for all the organizations and speakers as well for you to digest the information at your leisure. Have a great evening, and we will see you all next month for the next conversation. Take care of yourself and each other. Thank you, Curtis. Thank you. Thanks. Nice meeting, y'all.